Hello, this is Bob McFetrich with Beck with Electric, and I'd like to thank you for downloading our training session for the M6200A. In this particular session, we will look at how to navigate the different screens on the control, what the different LEDs mean, and what the different toggle switches uh, do. So to start with, the M6200A, unlike our uh, M2001C product, the screen will always be lit up and have text on it. So there is no uh, sleep mode for the M6200A. Its sleep mode is returning to what is referred to as its home screen. And so the home screen is the starting point for all navigation. It means that the user is logged out. And from that point, we can begin to navigate. And if we get lost at any point, everything we're going to be discussing is from starting from the home screen as a starting point. So if you're not in the home screen or on the home screen, if you hit the exit button and you keep hitting the exit button, it'll bring you up one menu at a time and sooner or later you should return to the home screen. Also, after 15 minutes of no activity, if the control's on any other screen, it will automatically return itself back to the home screen. And the home screen is configurable. Using TapTalk, if we go to Utility and then select Control Information, this screen here will show up. The top part of it is grayed out because these are not writable settings. This is showing what the serial number of the control is and what the current version of firmware is but the bottom two lines here are the two lines for the home screen so you can put any text in you want for both lines save it and then that's what you should see up on your home screen most utilities for a regulator will put the substation name or if it's a line regulator the feeder number as the top line and then the second line may be a combination of feeder and phase or just phase. But there uh, really is no limitations other than it's 20 characters per line. So we're going to begin with the LEDs. So this would be the front of a 6200A control. And you can see we have a raise LED, a lower LED, a manual LED, and a local LED on this side of the control. Now the raise and the lower LEDs will currently, depending on the version of firmware you have, they may either stay on solid at all times or they may blink. In the versions previous, they would be on as, as soon as you left band. So if we were at a band and calling for a raise, the raise light would be on solid and it would stay on solid until the voltage came back into band. Same with the lower LED. On the newer versions of firmware, the LED will be on solid when it is, I mean it will be blinking when it is timing towards the operation and then once the time delay expires, it will be on solid. But for current versions of firmware, it is on solid even when it is timing. The manual LED below will be on if the control is in manual. There are two ways the control can be in manual. Either the auto manual switch could be in a manual position, in which case the manual light will be on. Or it could be in the automatic position, but we could be in manual remotely. So if you come to a control and you see the manual light on and the auto manual switch in auto, that means that the control is currently in manual via SCADA. And then the next LED down is the local LED. This LED is driven solely off the remote local switch. So in the remote position, SCADA has full control of this particular control of in the local position, you are in a read-only from SCADA. So we will still respond to analog input requests, digital input requests, class polls, but we will not accept any setting changes via analog outputs or any controls via binary outputs. 
On the other side, if we start at the top, we have a transmit and receive, which is for the 232 port. And they'll be flashing if your 232 port has activity on it. We have an OK light that should be on all the time. We have an alarm LED that we're going to discuss down in a few slides, but it basically is an indication that something's in an abnormal condition. We have a reverse power LED that will be on if the control is in reverse power mode. And a voltage reduction LED that if it is on, it indicates you are in one of the three stages of reduction. And when it's on, it'll be on solid for a while, then it'll blink either one, two, or three times, and then go back to being solid. If you count the number of blinks, that'll tell you whether you're in level one, one blink, level two for two blinks, or level three reduction, which would be three blinks. With it off, then you are not in reduction. Now, we also have a voltage reduction LED push button that we're going to talk about that can trigger voltage reduction locally at the panel. The final light is the neutral light and this LED should be on when the regulator is in the neutral position. Now everything inside this box here has specific designations and that these things will operate correctly even if the control is not operating correctly. So all these things, these switches, these plugs, and this LED are prior to the microprocessor. That means that if the panel is not properly functioning, the neutral light should still function. The auto manual switch to raise lower and the voltage switches should all function. Or it also functions as the enter button. And the voltage reduction button is dedicated to voltage reduction only and it will only be operational if you're on the home screen. So if you're on the home screen and you enter the voltage reduction then you should see menus come up to tell you which level of reduction you want to go in or out of. But that button is only functional when you are at the home menu. Next we have our switches and we have three large switches. The first is the external internal switch. So you can power up the control by putting a drop cord or 120 with your return on the common and your hot on the external and then if you were to hit the external switch the control would power up or you can power it up via its terminal block and its internal wiring in which case you would select internal and it should power up and in the off position it should power down so to cycle power all we have to do is toggle it to the off position the second switch is a raise lower switch it's got a center position that does nothing. If you push it up, it'll raise. You push it down, it will lower. And again, this switch will work even if you're in uh, manual and the control is not in service. And finally, we have an auto manual switch. And with the auto manual switch, we have three positions. In automatic, motor power is routed to the control, but not to the raise lower switch. In manual, motor power is run to the raise lower switch, but not to the control. And in the off position, which is the center position, motor power does not go to the control or the raise lower switch. So motor power can be present at the raise lower switch or at the control, but never at both places and can be in neither place. And finally, we have a meter out. So if I take and put a meter between the comm and the meter out, I will read the sense voltage that the control is using to determine whether the voltage is in band or not. Finally, we have two smaller switches. We discussed the SCADA cutout switch earlier with the LED associated with it. And the other switch is the dry can reset. So if you press that switch in either the up or the down position, it should reset the dry cans on the regulator. Now, just to reiterate this fact, on the 6200A, 
these switches will operate even if the CPU is not operating. So what that means is if I place this control in manual, even if the control is not functioning, I can still then put a meter across the meter out in the COM button, read the voltage, and issue local raises and lowers to get the voltage back in the band. So that is a benefit in that I don't have to fix the panel first to get the voltage back in the band. I can get the voltage in the band first, then worry about what's going on with the control. The other thing that's nice is when you put it in off or manual, voltage never makes it to the output contacts of the control. So you can see that the only way we get voltage to the output of the output contacts of the control, which are these two right here, is if it's in automatic mode. What that means is if the control were to have a failure and attempt to get up a raise or lower while in manual, it would not tap the regulator because it would not have any voltage to drive the, the motors. So this is a very important safety issue with a lot of the other panels. The motor power is brought directly to the control and remains on the control. And therefore, if you're in manual but an output gets up, it has motor power and it will tap even a manual. With the Beckwith panels, the motor power is broken before it gets to the control's outputs so it would be equivalent to pulling the fuse. As long as it is in the off or the manual position, there is no motor power to the contacts, and even if this raise or lower contact were to energize, it would have no impact on the operation of the regulator. Now, we talked about the alarm LED. And what that is for is we can have different cases or scenarios where something is in the abnormal state. And we can configure what scenarios we want for abnormal. For instance, if I want to, if I'm blocking on tap position, I can check these off and then anytime I'm blocking via tap position, I would have the alarm LED on and the text here would actually scroll across the home screen. So my options are COM block. So in other words, if I were in automatic mode here and my manual light was on, that's an indication that we're being blocked remotely. But if you want further indication, you can check this off. And then it would also drive this LED. And it would also say communications block. We can block on tap the voltages, an abnormal tap position. Uh, line drop or line current, reverse power, the voltage reduction, and if you're using the VAR bias we're going to discuss in a future setting with line drop compensation, then both this one and that one will be discussed at that point. But the general rule here is if it's checked off when it's in the abnormal state, it will drive the LED, it'll scroll text across the home screen, and when it gets back to normal, the LED will clear and the home screen will go back to its normal home screen. So this is a way to help uh, troublemen, linemen, operators when they come on site to verify that there's nothing blocking the regulator and if there is something they can see exactly what it is. And here's an example of an alarm condition. So we can see down here the alarm LED is on and the home screen instead of just showing in the typical home screen is saying that the alarm is active and that the alarm is a block raise on tap position. So this would be the indication to the operator that we have uh, control being blocked on tap position on the raise side and once that problem is corrected then the LED will go off and the home screen will return to the home screen. Now another button that can be configured is the wake button. And the wake button allows the user 
to scroll through and select any of the points on this side of the configuration and drag them to this side and then put them in any order they want. Once they're here, now when a lineman or an operator depresses the wake button from the home screen, it will start continuously scrolling through each of these points one at a time for about one second per point. If the operator were to hit it a second time, it would freeze on that screen, and then using these two up and down arrows, the operator can scroll at their own pace between these, and if you hit it a third time, it returns back to the home screen. So the idea of the wake button is for users that don't frequently use the panel and don't necessarily know where all the data is stored under what menu or submenu. Instead of having to know how to scroll through all the screens to get at what they want, we're going to configure everything they want in one place. And with one button access, they will be able to continuously see that data. Hit it a second time, it'll scroll at their own rate, and hit it a third time, and it'll go back to the main menu. So this is another area where we're hoping we're making this panel much easier for the operators. Now, the menu itself, starting at the home page, we have hot links, which are each of the navigation buttons. So you can see we had the monitor button, the set point button, the configuration button, the communications button, and the utility button. If I hit one of those, then it'll take me, for instance, if I were to hit the monitor button from the home screen, this is the screen that would show up next. It would tell me that I'm currently in the monitor section. If I were to hit the right arrow, I would go to the set points. If I were to hit the left arrow, I would go to the utility. If I hit the down arrow, then it's going to come down into the submenus now. And the first submenu would be metering. And again, if I were to hit the right, the next one would be present demand. If I were to hit the left, it would be tap information. And if I were to hit the down arrow, I would now be into the metering data. Once I get into the metering data here, if I hit the down, I will keep going through these values. And then if I get to here and I hit the down again, it'll just scroll and stay in this loop. Once I want to exit this, I have to hit the exit button to bring me back up to metering. And then I can either scroll across, or if I want to, I can hit the exit button again, which may bring me up to monitoring, and then I can scroll, or I can hit the exit button a third time, in which case I would go back to the home screen. So once I'm in this menu, hitting the exit once brings me to metering, twice to monitor, and the third time I would be back at the home screen. So under the monitoring, you can see that we can view the metering data, the demand data, the energy man metering, the demand history, information on the tap position, and also information on certain status points, switch statuses, alarm statuses, and output statuses. If you see a screen with an E at the end, like this one right here, that means while you're on that screen, if you hit the enter button, it will reset that value. So any of these values where you see E's, if you're on that screen and you hit the enter button, it'll actually reset that value and start calculating a new demand or a new drag hand. We also can preset the tap position via this button right here. So, when we navigate to a setting that we want to change, we would then, when we get to that setting, we would hit the enter button on that screen. And when we do that, depending on the setting, it may request a password to be entered. Some of the settings are level 1, some settings are level 2. So, if the password is requested, we will have to enter in the password. This line here shows the character that you currently can change. 
then if I were to hit the up and the down key that number would change between numbers and letters and once I was happy to say my password was I needed a value of two for this character I would hit the enter the up button a couple times until I saw two once I was happy with that I would hit the right button and it would slide me over one more character and the password can be from six to fifteen characters long once the password is entered correctly what I should see then is on the screen I should see a solid C this indicates I can now change the value and again my cursor is over the six so if I wanted to change this to 15, if I were to hit the down arrow button one time, the value would change to down 15. If I wanted to change it to 5, I could then hit this button, scroll over to the 1, and then hit the down arrow and make that a 0, and then I would have a value of 5. So when we're in here changing, the right and the left buttons move you from one character to the next, and then the up and the down buttons allow you to change the value on that particular character. Once I'm happy with that value, if I were to hit the enter button, it would accept that value, the flashing C would go away, and now it would show you the new value. So we were on this screen originally with 16. We hit the enter button to get the flash, or the solid C. We then changed the value to 15. We hit the enter button. The solid C goes away, and now it's showing you the new value for that particular setting. If I were to hit the exit button instead of the enter button, it would leave and come back to the original screen without the C unchanging the setting. So if I get into a screen and I've changed the value and then realized I did not want to change it, if I hit the exit button, it'll return it back to the previous value. Also, I believe it's a five minute timer, but if you're in one of these screens and you're changing a setting, if you do not hit any keys after a five minute period of time, it will re back you out and return the setting to the way it was. So that is basically how we're going to enter any value. Once we get to a value via the navigation screens, if we want to change it, we're going to hit the enter button. We may have to enter a password depending on the value. Once we get that in, we should see the solid C. Then we can scroll and then get on the characters we want to change. Go up and down to change the values. Then if we hit the enter again, it'll save the value. If we hit the exit, it will not. So this next screen would be for the set point. So from the main menu, if I hit the set point button, it would bring me to this menu. And then if I were to hit the down button, it would bring me the common settings. If I were to go down again, these would be the settings I could change but I could also go across. Now some screens are only visible de depending on certain settings. For instance, this power flow reverse may not be visible and that will be determined by the power flow, the reverse power direction. So if I've got it set to ignore or to block, we're not going to see these because there's no reason to have them in those particular modes. But if I were to select regulate in reverse, or return to neutral, then all of a sudden they would be, uh, I'm sorry, if I were to select regulate reverse or regulate and reverse measured or distributed generation mode, then either all of these or some of these would be available. For instance, in distributed generation mode, only these two would be available because they're the only two settings that are allowable. Also notice this tree here. We have a setting for line drop compensation that can make it set to either RX or Z. So if it's set to Z, only the Z is going to be shown. If it's set to RX, only the RX is going to be shown. So there is some intelligence built into the screens and it's only going to show you what it's configured to have. And here's another uh, set of screens, and this would be for configuration. 
Now, anything in set points is set off a level 1 password. Anything under configuration is going to require a level 2 password to change. So here's another way I can change the tap position. And again, we can go through. And once you get into one of these loops, if you keep hitting the down arrow button, you'll come back to the top again. So, for instance, if I started here, and this is the setting I wanted to change, if I come down to this one and then hit the up arrow button, it'll actually bring me back around, and I can get to this guy with only two keystrokes. So instead of hitting the down arrow button several times, from the top of the screen, if you hit the up arrow, it'll loop you back to the bottom of the screen and vice versa. And this next screen shows us all the navigations for the communications. But there is a special one here, and that has to do with the memory card. So when you hit the communications button, it'll bring you to one of two places, either to comm settings or to memory card. If there is an SD card in the slot and it is properly formatted and recognized, when you hit the communication button, it will immediately bring you to the memory card menu. If there is no memory card in the slot or it's not properly formatted, when you hit the communications button, it will bring you to the COM setting screen. Some of these screens will only be available, uh, for instance, the Bluetooth right here is only showing you the enable because it's currently disabled. Once it's you enable it, there would be more things that could show up. And finally, we have the utility screen. And in the utility screen, you can see that there's only two menus. One of them is the about, which is a way of finding the serial number and the version of firmware.